I always just say noon and midnight. I think the 12 is redundant. That's, that's true. Ooh, ooh. Now I can save even more time. <laughs> Little efficiency chip tips from Chuck. There we go. I may have saved you a whole minute over the rest of your life. How do you feel? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, if That's we discuss it for right? a minute, I think I've, <laughs> I've undone that. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to join a conversation with the Freelancer Show panelists and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. Sign up at freelancershow.com slash forum. Hey everybody, and welcome to episode 119 of the Freelancer Show. This week on our panel we have Eric Davis. Hello. Ruben Lerner. Hello from Beijing. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and this week we're going to be talking about finding your ideal client. So to start us off, I, I thought I'd point out last time we talked about finding a niche. And um, this is actually a different conversation. I, I've, I've had this talk with a few people and they're like, well, how is finding your ideal client and finding your niche different? And the way that it strikes me is that there is a lot of variation within your niche. So the way that you serve people, and they do inform each other. But the thing that really strikes me is your ideal client is the person or people that you want to work with, and your niche is your industry or whatever and how you're going to solve their problems. Does that make sense to you guys? If we say no, is that the end of the show? <laughs> <laughs> if we say no, then we just replay last week's. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say that's about right. I mean, the niche is like you know the, the subject, but within any niche, you're going to have lots of different types of clients, right? You know, big companies, small companies, and then all sorts of different areas they service. Mm -hmm. So there's some overlap, but I'd say it's still distinct. There's similar and there's overlap, but there's a bit of a difference. Like if your niche is an industry and your ideal client is I'm targeting this industry, then yeah, there's overlap. But if your ideal client is more talking about psychographics, demographics, like the actual people, then your niche might be in an industry and there's actually no overlap. It's more of like an intersection of the two. So it depends on how you define it. But for most people, I think there's an overlap. Most people pick a niche that is either kind of the problem that they solve, the services that they have, and or like industries they focus on. And then the other side is the ideal client is going to be people in these industries that have this problem. Right. Just to give an example, a few years ago, I wound up building at least three or four social networks. So that was kind of my niche, at least for a little while. And I wound up working with a lot of folks who were kind of in the startup phase. They wanted the social network built, and they had ideas on how they were going to monetize it. At least most of them did, and and things like that. And so my ideal client was more along the lines of you know startup people or people who wanted to start a new business, as opposed to people who needed my particular area of expertise and had that problem that I could solve for them. And I, I found that generally to be true. I, I tend to really enjoy working much more with startup folks than with bigger businesses who need another person on their team. I agree. First, first of all, I also enjoy more working with startups. I think it's like more varied, more interesting, and way, way, way less bureaucracy. But I agree that it's sort of been useful over time for me to think about, well, what are the companies that I've enjoyed working with and what do they have in common? And that helps me to focus to some degree my marketing efforts, but also when someone wants to talk to me, how seriously do I take it and how seriously do I pursue it? Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm a little curious, and I kind of came to my ideal client the same way, but what was kind of the process or what, what kind of brought you to the point where you could identify uh, an ideal client? <laughs> well, for one, unhappiness with some of them. So you know, I, I think it was less at the beginning at least, me thinking about who are my ideal clients and more me thinking about who was making me miserable or who did I not like working with. First of all, I worked for a while for big companies before I became a freelancer, and I decided I really like working with small companies or I like working in small companies. And here and there I've worked with big companies, but I just found even as a freelancer, it's really it can get annoying, things get lost in the bureaucracy, there are way too many people involved in making decisions. And also, quite frankly, they didn't stick me in one tiny part of things. And I like to have much more, uh, I don't know, a, a varied set of tasks. And a startup, typically, there's so many things to be done that they'll call me in to do lots of different things. 
So I think it was that sort of experience. Also, I don't know. I mean, like, I was going to say that I tend to work with a lot of technical people, but there are certain types of non-technical people who I really like working with. I think it's mostly, and this is going to sound like the, well, I guess it's the ideal. We're talking about the ideal here where they know what they want to do business wise and they just totally trust me on the technology and they're not going to try to second guess me. I think what really annoys me is when the te- non-technical people are constantly second guessing what I'm doing. Are you sure this is right? Are you sure this is good? My brother-in-law suggested something. And then I'm spending all my time defending decisions as opposed to actually doing things. Yeah, that makes sense. I teach kind of like a similar way where you look at like what clients you, you know, if you have some, which, which ones you hated, what you hated about them. Cause even the very worst client still has some good factors. It's not like this person's just low life scum. Like they, they might pay on time. They might have interesting projects, whatever, but you got to look at what you really enjoy doing, what, what you're good at, what you can actually do the best return for the client, you know, and then kind of like, you know, how are you designing your business? Like, is it, are you trying to make a ton of money? Are you trying to have time off to pursue a hobby or whatever? You know, what kind of clients would fit that mold? And then kind of the reverse side of like, you know, which ones wouldn't, you know, if you're, if you want something where you don't have to worry about, you know, like at five o'clock in the afternoon, you're, you're done for it. Can you move on? You probably don't want to work for companies that have to have a 24 seven presence or, you know, you don't want to be managing their servers because if a server goes down, they expect you to jump on it. And so you kind of got to look at what you want, what you don't want. And it's, it takes time. Like, it's a process that you kind of, you don't come up with the ideal client definition and then that's the one you use for the next 10 years. Like you come up with one and it's your first draft and you revise it like pretty much with every project. It's also a constant learning process. So I just started a project a few weeks ago um, that a friend of mine pulled me in on. And this friend of mine, you know, he's, he's a great guy. He's sort of acting as their interim CTO and then brought me in to do the actual development. And this is the first time in years that I'm not talking very much at all directly with a client. Like, I'm not talking with the project managers, but rather I'm talking to this friend of mine, and he's telling me what needs to happen. And I'm finding that it's actually kind of frustrating that I'm so used to having these interactions with the client. I'm so used to being a part of their project planning that even though it's a great project and it's interesting and they pay well and everything, I'm not sure if I'll take such clients in the future. But this is something I never really considered until now when I'm having a a negative experience. Yeah. And that's something like you don't know. And then you work with a client where it's like a full on contracting position where you just, you're a button seat person. You're just doing the work and you miss the, the client interaction. Or on the other side, if, if you want the button seat, you want to just do the work you're doing, whatever it is. And you don't want to deal with the client. That's going to factor into your ideal client and it's going to change. Like, do you market to agencies to get subcontracting work or do you chase clients directly? Yeah. One other thing that I've really found with uh, some of the stuff that I've done is that um, if I get more specific, it also really helps. So we talked about finding a niche and, you know, the the more specific you are with your niche, the easier it is to kind of target people who have that problem. And it's it's the same with the ideal client. If you can identify who they are and uh, really get an idea around what kind of person they are and who they are, where they're at in life, things like that, then a lot of times it makes it easier to target them. So for example, my ideal client is somebody, you know, in their 40s or 50s who's kind of had a, had a career. They've got this idea that they want built and, and that's where my niche comes in, you know, so it's, they're going to be using this, you know, they, they have this problem to solve, but their kids are gone or teenagers and, uh, you know, they're looking to kind of make that transition. They don't have a lot of technical skills. And so they, they need somebody to advise them and help them and also to build whatever it is that their master plan is. So that's kind of where my target market is. And, you know, I can almost see this person in my mind. You know, I can, I can see their house. I can, you know, see the car they drive. I can envision a lot of these details. And so when I go out and try and target things, especially with Facebook and stuff, you can actually put in demographics for people. Then I could actually go in and, and advertise specifically to that group and find ways to help them achieve their dreams or solve their problems. And the entrepreneurial spirit is something that I really identify with. And so I get really excited when somebody else is excited about their idea. So, you know, dealing with the bigger companies, that's where I find that I lack is that, you know, I'm usually dealing with some middle manager somewhere. And it's not to say that these people aren't smart or good at what they do, but they just don't have that drive that the people who are out there putting their own money on the line and building their own business have. 
and and that's why I get excited. And so I've been able to narrow this down, and and you know I have a very specific idea of who I want to find, and it helps me find them. Yeah, I, I talk a lot about you know when you're marketing or when you're talking to potential clients, like it's a relationship, and you know also kind of in the dating idea of like you know you first meet people, you get to know them, you figure out like if there's compatibility, if there's a good fit there. And a lot of my stuff, basically with my clients, is I try to get to, yes, I like this person, no, I don't, as fast as possible. Because I'd rather end a relationship and let the client move on and go work with someone else faster. That way they can get what they need, they can get the value they need, and I can find someone that I'm a better fit for. And that's what it's about. It's about fit, compatibility, that sort of thing. Yeah, and when you talk about that, the other thing that that comes to mind is the fact that uh, a lot of this business, I mean, some people are just going to find you on the internet, they're going to look at your website, they're going to trust you instinctively, and they're going to hire you. But if you're in the business for a long time, and you want the referral traffic, and you want a lot of these other things to work out in your favor, then you're leaning a lot on reputation. And nothing will hurt that more than having somebody that you said yes to turn out to not be a good fit and then you were unable to make them happy and so then when somebody comes along and says hey do you know anybody they'll either say no or they'll say no i don't but whatever you do don't hire that guy yeah you don't want to be that guy yeah i i found more and more well whenever i have an initial intro uh, initial uh, communication with a potential client i mention this that let's talk and see if we're a good fit for one another and not only do I think that's true, but I think it's important that they understand that it's not always a matter of I'm good at what I do, I'm not good at what I do, or they have a good project, they don't have a good project. It's a lot of chemistry. It's personal chemistry and also just making sure it's a good match for everyone's needs. Totally agree. Do you guys have like a specific avatar is the term that I keep hearing for that person, you know, your your ideal client. Have you worked that out or do you just have a, a, a more vague idea? How, how specific have you gotten? I was trying to look. I can't find it right now. I have a, a document or two that talks about it. It's my ideal client and niche are kind of intermixed a lot. So it's kind of the same thing, but most of it is about the business. It's what stage your business is, like what services and products it does, what industries they're in. And then there's a couple kind of personality characteristics and that's based on like if I'm going to be working with this person, like if that's going to be, you know, the, the end buyer, the end client, you know, kind of things like they know the business, I know the tech. And so if kind of we come down to like, not an argument, but like if like one person's saying one thing, one person's saying the other, then whoever owns that area kind of would win. Um, and that's kind of the idea. You don't want a non-technical person dictating how to write SQL statements. And I've had it. And like I said, I refined it over the years and I keep changing the format. And that's why it's scattered about, but I also have in my head, like, okay, this is kind of my ideal client. And I know from my past what my good clients are. And so I can actually like see parts of my good clients and new prospects and be like, yeah, I think this person's going to be good because of this reason. Um, and then I also have a list of like, these are things that if they do, basically they're fired, they're out of the game. Like I, I just won't put up with people that have even one of these kind of criteria. Yeah. I, I don't think I have like uh, an avatar or a, a set of criteria that I'm looking for that I've ever formalized. But I do have a bunch of projects on which I work that I was just the happiest, that it was a great chemistry, it was an interesting project, they paid on time, they paid well. And so when I talk to people, I'm constantly comparing in my mind, well, maybe this project could be like that one. And if it seems like it could come close, then I'll pursue it more. And if it does not, the, the farther away it is from that, then the less enthusiastic I'll be and you know, sometimes even just say, no, I'm, I'm not a good match for you. I would say that personality is, and personal chemistry, is a large factor. <laughs> I've said it before, I'm tired of working with jerks, and I just don't feel like I should have to do that anymore uh, in my career. That's supposed to be part of the advantage of freelancing, right? That you get to work with nice and interesting people. So when I'm talking to someone, if they seem like they have no idea what they're talking about business-wise, or if they seem like they're just going to be impossible to work with, then I decline or point them elsewhere. So I can hear somebody saying, though, if you start saying no to people who, you know, will pay, will probably pay on time, but they don't meet that ideal client criteria, are you crazy to be saying no to them? Well, that's something I, I think we should have kind of mentioned at the beginning. The ideal client is what it sounds like. It's the perfect client. It's, you know, this you build up a composite, a person that's like, if you could work with just them for the rest of your life, like you'd be happy. 
I don't think I've never met anyone that's actually been the ideal client. It's all shades of gray. Like this person's 40% ideal, 50% ideal, maybe 80. What you want to do is, you know, take a look. I mean, this is like big picture. Like look at where your sales are, look at what your leads are, how much work you can take on. And you kind of, it's kind of like a ranking. Like if you have, say you can take on two clients right now, like that's, that's kind of how much workload you can take on. You have three leads and you look at them and say, okay, well, this one's a 30%, this one's a 60%, and this one's an 80%. Well, you're going to take on the 80 and the 60 because they're the most ideal for you. And a 30, even if it's paid work, even if it's work you could do, that's probably not going to set you up in a position where it's going to be a good business decision. And sometimes like if you have a buffer of like emergency funds or you kind of have experience and know what you're doing, you could have no work and keep and turn down any leads that are like below 40 or 50. Um, just because you know from past experience, like that's probably not going to be a good thing. It's probably going to hurt you in the long term than anything. And you'd rather just kind of wait it out and find someone that's better. And so I think it's important. It, it sounds weird, like you're ranking people, but it's kind of something you have to do, especially if you have more leads than time. Yeah, it's it, it's definitely a matter of balancing supply and demand, and also how how much cushion you have. Right? We've talked in the past about trying to have some sort of financial cushion while you're freelancing and before you freelance, so that you can hold out for a few weeks, or if you're really lucky, for a few months before finding a great client. But look, all of us have, I think, compromised in one way or another on clients in the past. I think that's normal. So, you know, you find someone, you say, well, I guess I'll work with them because, well, I need the work. Hopefully over time, that happens less and less. And hopefully over time, you find the right people approaching you. But basically, this is, you know, you should think of it as, uh, you know, trying to find someone who's better than someone else, you know, sort of, but don't, don't make a, as it said, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And you don't want to basically be saying no to every potential client because they're not perfect. Because then you're, you're really going to end up in trouble. And I, I think I've shared this on the podcast before, but like my end goal is to have like a product business with, you know, one to a few products. And that's like my day to day work. But every quarter, every few months, I would pick up, you know, a freelancing client just to kind of keep things fresh, to do new things. And in that case, it would be, the product business is paying for everything I need. So I can be ultra picky and pick people that would be like 80, 90, maybe even like 95 on the ideal client scale. So that's something to think about. If you're getting started, you might pick anyone above 10% or anyone at all. Like you might say like, I have no barrier because you need money, you need to pay the bills, whatever. But I think just kind of having that in the back of your head of like, okay, now you can be a bit more picky or now you want to be a bit less picky. Um, it's a dynamic you can shift without actually changing who your ideal client is. So we talked a little bit about it, but I'm curious. I mean, the way that I identified my ideal client is the same way that you guys said you did. These are the people I liked working with. These are the things I liked about working with them. And so that's kind of my ideal client. If somebody's brand new, do you guys have any tips or tricks for doing that besides going and working for people and figuring out who's awesome and who's not awesome? Yeah, I actually just put in the chat, like I have a couple of blog posts on this and I actually address like the new, you know, if you're new to freelancing, depending on how new you are to the work you're doing, like you can look at past um, employers, past bosses, past coworkers, um, even if you're fresh out of school, like even high school, like look at past teachers or just people you have interacted with, past friends, because uh, like I said before, all businesses are made up of people. And so there's going to be personality types you get along with. There's going to be personality types that rub you the wrong way. If you've done projects, you know, even if it's like community service or stuff for like a hobby, like look at how those were run, how the managers kind of did that. Like, was there a, say you were like on a highway cleanup team, was the the person managing that kind of like get to work, get to work, or were they kind of very laid back and chill? And did you enjoy that? And just use that as like your your first draft. I mean, as you get clients, as you find people that could be a potential client that you end up declining, like you're going to change its definition. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. And I mean, again, like my first job after college was at HP, big company, and they were very nice to me and all. But I said. Never. I'm never going to work for a big company again. And at that point, I wasn't really thinking about freelancing. And then my next job was working for Time Warner, which was at the time, at least, a very large company. But my group was treated like a small startup. And so that's when I said, wow, I really like working with small groups where everyone's doing a little of everything. And so when I started freelancing, I mean, I continued working with them. But I tried to find 
those same sorts of groups because I, I felt like it was a good match. Um, and over time, I think I've pretty much confirmed that to myself. So, yeah, going based on previous employers, volunteer projects, any experience you have is going to teach you something about what's good for you. And worst case scenario, you try something, it's not a good match, and you move on to something else. Yeah, I've, I've had a similar experience where, you know, the companies that I worked for that were rather large, I, I, I need to tell more stories and, and be more concrete about this. So my first job out of college was I worked for a company called Mosey. They do online backup. I loved working there. There were 10 employees in the company when I got there. It was just terrific. Everybody was close-knit group, kind of knew everybody. Um, everybody just pulled together and made things work. And there were a lot of things about Mosey and just kind of the passion and, and excitement for what we were doing that was very contagious. And I really enjoyed being in that environment. And uh, then they got acquired by EMC Corporation, which is a big company out in Boston. And things changed, and I didn't really enjoy being there anymore. And, you know, I'm not blaming EMC Corporation, and, you know, there are a lot of things that went into why it wasn't a great place for me to work anymore. But I instinctively, after that, recognized the kind of environment that was around and whether or not that was the kind of environment that I really enjoyed being in. And so I could I could feel out those team dynamics. I could feel out those the the company flavor. And if it wasn't a good fit for me, then I I turned down the job. And I actually I turned down a full time job a couple of years later. Um, I just went in. I just did not have that vibe. Uh, you know that that happy feeling. And it turned out that they laid people off a couple months later. And I don't know if I picked up on that particularly, but if I had taken that job that wasn't a good fit then I would have wound up in a position where I would have lost my job. And then, you know, a month or two later, I actually found a job that was a great fit. And uh, I worked there for six months. And then it turned out they had made some mistakes and they had to lay some people off. And so I got laid off and went into freelancing. But, you know, that being said, I've also had clients that I have picked up that I knew weren't my ideal client. And, uh, you know, I knew the situation wasn't the situation that I wanted to be in. And I took the job anyway and wound up being very unhappy working with them. And so you, you really do kind of have to pay attention to that because, I mean, the reasons that most people go freelance isn't for the money. It's because they're looking for a particular lifestyle or something that they want to get out of their life day to day or week to week. And if you're not getting that, then you need to have a look at your approach and figure out, you know, what's going to get you there. And working for people that you're excited and happy to work for is definitely a big deal. But then, you know, that came off of the, you know, look at your previous employers. Cause yeah, I mean, I had a couple of employers that I just loved working for. And it's interesting you said that like company culture is one of those things that people talk about and it sounds very abstract, but you really feel it when you're there. And there's some companies that are just great to work with and a fun, positive atmosphere and people are willing to put in extra time, extra hours together. Uh, there are other companies where it just feels like a chore or you know, they're about to be sold or they're having problems and it just, it just feels terrible. And if you have the option to work with the more positive ones, then, you know, all the better. Yep, absolutely. The other thing is, is that some companies have a different uh, feel about working with people that aren't under their roof, so to speak. And so you yeah. have to, you have to be careful about that too. And usually if you talk to people, you can get a pretty good idea of what the expectation is and what they think of remote workers. But, you have to pick up on that as well. They may have a healthy corporate culture or company culture, but they may not have a healthy view of people who are remote or in whatever circumstance you're going to be working in. And if that's the case, then you need to pay attention to that so that you can understand how you're going to fit. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot. There's, I mean, it's biases. Like I've heard of owners of companies that they believe that if you got a degree from an online college, even if it's like university of Phoenix where it's, you know, credited all that, or if you went to community college, even if you transferred to like a four year college afterward, you're seen as not as smart and looked down upon that. And I mean, there's some, some organizations you, you can't work from home. You can't work outside of the office, even outside of like high security, government, military type stuff. And that's something, you know, you might be able to, you, you should try to pick it up before the project, but you might be able to pick it up early on and talking with them. One thing you have to be careful though is, the person you're talking to about the project, they might not be the actual kind of project leader, the, one of the main stakeholders. I've heard of like a manager approaches a freelancer to talk to them about something because the manager needs it. 
but it's above them like a VP or something and they have different biases and like Chuck was saying, like they might look down on remote workers or even as on contractors and that's going to flavor the, the whole uh, relationship. Yep, absolutely. And it's, it's totally okay. So I just want to point another uh, couple of things out here. It's totally okay if somebody isn't your ideal client, if you need the work to take the work, but be aware that you're going to have to change the way you do things to a certain degree and make certain concessions in order to make them happy. That being said, it's also perfectly okay if you find somebody who's a better fit as, as long as you're doing right by your current client to tell them, you know what, you're really not exactly the right fit for me and I think I'm going to go do this other thing. I think a lot of folks, you know, understand and kind of expect that a little bit from people who aren't employees and even from employees, I think they need to expect it a little more often, you know, where they're going to go where they feel like they are best utilized and happier. But it's fine. It's fine to do both. You know, just make sure that you've done right by the people that you're leaving behind and you're going to do right by the people you're excited to go work for. One thing that's uh, an inter- interesting relationship with a client is as when I got started, they weren't like an ideal client. They probably halfway like they they had some side on some stuff on the technical side that I wasn't good at or didn't agree with. And then some stuff is like the personality that I didn't agree with. But what I actually did instead of like finding a new client and just like transitioning out of that project with them, I actually had several frank conversations with them and it wasn't a complaint fest, but it's based like, here's the things you guys are doing wrong. Here's how you're treating me wrong. And they did the same for me. And what came out of it is we both had a greater understanding of how everyone in the company worked, how the different teams worked. And so we actually were able to make significant changes. And now they're like really high up there on my ideal client scale because they know how I work, how the best way to get stuff to me. I know how they work. I know how to set expectations for them. And so I was able to turn kind of a 50-50 ideal client up into like a really good ideal client. And so that's something... You know, we had a lot of trust. We had a lot of, you know, we were open to do that. But that's, uh, that's something you can do too. If you find a client that it's not the greatest thing to start with, but after you work with them for a bit, you might try it to try to make it a better environment for you. And, you know, they might not even know that, you know, you have these different criteria or different needs that they're not fulfilling. I talked to several people over the last little while that have, they're like, well, what do I need to go do to be a good freelancer? And, I tell them that, uh, you know, the ABCs of being a good freelancer is always be communicating. And I, I think that's really what it boiled down to there. You know, you communicated about what you needed and they were open to providing that. And yeah, it really is a terrific way to transform a, a so-so client into an ideal client. I think it's also important to point out that, um, you know, ideal client even in the best of situations, things are going to change. I mean, Eric described one where it started off being maybe not so great and then it got much better. Things can also get worse, and they can get worse because of them, because of you, or just because of other circumstances. Uh, I had a client who I worked with for, I don't know, five years, eight years, maybe even ten years, um, and it was really terrific, and we had a wonderful relationship, but he made some business decisions, and the business went south, and that was that. And so we still have a good personal relationship. Uh, probably about once a year, we're in touch for small things. But once he uh, was lacking for money uh, and once he was a little more desperate, then the business relationship got a little more strained. Um, but that's just the, the nature of the beast. It's like relationships with people, right? They, sometimes you're going to be closer with friends and farther away from friends and it'll, it'll ebb and flow over time. Is there a particular set of exercises that people can do to start finding their ideal clients now? I mean, once once you've identified somebody, you know, you're like, I'm looking for people kind of in the startup phase, you know, they have maybe themselves and one other partner or employee, you know, how do you go about translating that into how do I find them? And that's the billion dollar question. It's marketing, it's getting in front of them or where they would be, you know, Chuck, you mentioned like on Facebook, you can do kind of demographic targeting. And if your ideal client is very demographically or even geographically based, advertising platforms might be able to target them a bit better. But if it's like, you know, this is a nice person, he works in the startup industry, this and that, like it's going to be hard to actually narrow that down. And I mean, I would try to slant your marketing or try to slant your messages to ones that are going to resonate with that target, like the target client, but it's really, really hard to target them. I mean, if, if you're going after like really early stage startups, like, 
You probably want to be doing content marketing to get on Hacker News. You probably wouldn't be running Google ads. You would probably be going to um, like startup or those kind of like meetup events and meet people there, a bit of in-person networking. Maybe maybe you would look for some VCs or angels that you know in your community and you know talk to them and try to get a, a, a network going there. But, you know, there is no one size fits all. Like if you're targeting big Fortune 500 companies, then, you know, you'd probably be flying out to events where they're at or going to trade shows for them or, you know, whining and dining them. And that's why I think getting your ideal client definition, uh, at least the first draft of it hammered out is actually going to influence the marketing and how you're actually going to run your business. But there's, there's no like, you know, follow these five steps to find your ideal client. I like it. Anything you want to add, Ruben? Not specifically. I mean, it's it's a long period. Look, I've been doing this for for a long time, and I'm still feeling out how to find the right clients. And sometimes it's better, and sometimes it's worse. But I definitely think it's a matter of constantly talking to people. Um, you know, you said always be communicating. The the old sales phrase is always be closing. But in order to be closing all the time, you have to just be talking to people all the time. I just enjoy just sort of personal enjoyment meeting with potential clients. Uh, assuming there's a semblance of a chance that we might work together just because I like meeting new people and I like hearing their ideas and how their business is structured. And sometimes I'll walk away shaking my head thinking, oh my God, there's no way that's ever going to work. Sometimes I write and sometimes I'm wrong. But the fact that I'm always talking to people and always out there raises the chances, increases the chances that I will find someone who's a good match. And sometimes these things have come from completely surprising circumstances and directions. Do you have any examples? Look, I've got this, uh, this friend, not even such a close friend, but yeah, this, this woman who I knew back in Boston, she moved to Israel and I moved to Israel. And then she introduced me to her husband and we had lunch twice or three times and he had a project he didn't have time for. So he called me up and said, Hey, would you like to work on such and such a project? And so I never expected really to get a project from him, but I did. And it's just a matter of the more people who know who you are and what you do, the greater the chances that someone's going to uh, surprise you with a potential project. doesn't mean it'll necessarily be a good one or a long-term one, but it's you know, certainly better than none, and it's better than you having to go and make cold calls. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, actually. like The one, quote, secret is if you can find one ideal client and whether or not you win the project, but if you can get a referral from them or to find out who they know, who they're you know, friends are, contacts, business associates, whatever, that's kind of your way in. Because once you know, like, okay, like say you do a project successfully for a startup, you know, they're going to know other people. You can talk about, hey, I, I did this thing for startup AYZ, um, who's now gone off and sold to Google or whatever. That makes you more presentable, makes you more desirable to other people who could be your ideal clients. And especially if you can get referrals, like that's like the best way to get a new client. Like you're, you don't have to really do any sales at that point. It's very, very light. But if you can do that, then it's, you know, the people you know, the, the people you've worked with, they're going to help you get more work, more work. And it's going to be a mirror of the original client you had. It's hard though sometimes because it's like you got to get that first client to get the next client. Well, how do you get the first client? Well, you have to have the other ones. And so it's sometimes it might be worth it just to kind of bootstrap and find one that's, not quite ideal or, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you're at a lower rate or it's working on a project that you don't care about or even you don't think it's going to be a successful business if it means you're getting the, your foot in the door and you can actually go after people that are a better fit. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing that you can do if you get in the door with them and not just referrals, but you can also say, Hey, you know what podcasts do you listen to? What TV shows do you watch? What magazines do you subscribe to? What blogs do you read? Where do you learn about entrepreneurship yourself? You know, if you can find out where they're at, if you find out where they're getting their information, you figure out where they're looking, then other people like them are also looking in those places. And so that you can figure out which of those intersect with your ideal client and which of them don't, and you can start to narrow down, okay, I need to be involved over here. I tried to get involved over there, and I found people that were kind of like my ideal client, but not quite. But this other, you know, this other option shows pl- promise. It, you know, works out nicely. They, you know, it has a lot of people that I really do want to connect with. And then you can figure it out from there. Yeah. And that process, going back to something you said earlier, Chuck, like that's called building an avatar. That's, you basically are building a profile of your ideal client. And I've done that for actually, um, 
two, maybe three of my products. I've gone and I've actually collected some of this information. I actually got on the phone and did like a half hour, hour long interview with someone who, you know, fit that profile as perfectly as I could and got all the information and then fed that into my marketing, my advertising, kind of how I would position things. And that's another great way to do it. And sometimes if you, you know, depending on who your ideal client is, you can do that for free without actually, you know, booking someone. If you find someone, they're like, yeah, I'd love to work with you, but I don't have any work for you right now. You might be able to say, well, could I interview you for half an hour or whatever? Or can I take you out to lunch or buy you some coffee and kind of get that kind of get the answers to that from them? And that could feed into actually your marketing. Yep, absolutely. One other thing that just came to mind was that if you know the market, so let's say you want to work on, I'm going to throw one out there. Uh, you know, you want to work with plumbers. Okay. So, you know, you can talk to plumbers and you can find out, you know, all of the stuff that we're talking about. But the other thing is, is that if they mention, well, I already have a guy, right? I, I, I know somebody who, you know, let's say you, you're a caulking freelancer, you know, I'm just making stuff up, but you know, you're really good at caulking joints. And so you get that, you know, you put the silicone in the right place and it seals it. And so, you know, you go talk to plumbers and they're like, well, I already have a guy. Well, go talk to the other guy, you know, and find out what he's doing. Find out where he's advertising. You know, maybe he has overflow work that he can hand off to you. And so, you know, you can start making a name for yourself either by association with him or by figuring out what he's doing and copying it. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And if it's working for him, it'll probably work for you. And by copy, Chuck means copy his process, copy his techniques, not copy his actual stuff. Like, don't, like, right. Xerox it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's uh, what I meant. Thank you. Yeah, advertise on the same sites he's advertising. Use similar marketing messages as he's doing, like, targeting the same kind of concepts or feelings, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Or you, the other thing you can do is you can make friends with him because he may know something that's very similar. Okay. You can work with plumbers. You, you'll do something very similar to what you think you can do. And maybe you'll find a niche there and then you can have more of a collaborative uh, re relationship instead of a, a competitive one. Yeah. And um, when I was doing Redmine, I basically was getting enough leads that I probably could have hired one or two full-time people to help me out. And I didn't want that for my business. And so I was actively recruiting other freelancers to get into Redmine to learn it because I wanted to give them work. Like I, I wanted these potential clients to have their problems solved. And I know I, at the time there were some freelancers I knew that they were kind of busy, but they could have used more work. And so I was trying to get them on and, you know, I was actively referring stuff to them. And it could be in this case, like, you know, that, um, plumbing freelancer, he might have work. On the other hand, he might you know, sit down with me and say, don't get into this business. I've, I've been trying to get out for 10 years and I just can't get out. You know, like you can get some advice from him. I, th I think that's actually, I mean, I know you guys have mentioned this in the past podcast about getting overflow work from other freelancers or agencies. And that's probably a good way to, to experiment with who your ideal client is as well. Because these agencies and other freelancers will have lots of different kinds of clients. And if they're willing to give some of their spillover work to you, you can try out a few things, big companies, small companies, different kinds of projects, long ones, short ones, and so forth. So much big as your head. So <laughs> and you'll, uh, over time, figure out who's a, a good match for you. Yeah, absolutely. Man, you guys are coming up with some good ideas. I should, I should write these down for myself, boy. That's what I was just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I think the big thing is, I know I didn't get it at first because I learned about Ideal Client from someone else, but... It's a range. It's a gradient. It's not a, this person's my ideal client and this person's not. It's someone, you know, you fit somewhere along the line and where you draw the line of, I'm going to work with this company or not is based on your current position and kind of where you want to be. Like if you're thinking strategic down the road, five years, you want to grow your business. You're probably going to want to take on more companies right now just to kind of have a bigger network. And that's no, you know, understanding that I could adjust kind of the, where that, you know, line is was actually something important in my business. And I didn't get that at first because I was scrambling to find work or I was turning a bunch of work down and beat myself up for either of those two. I didn't, there was no happy medium at that time. So I guess the next logical question is, let's say you have a potential client that you're talking to. How do you figure out that they're your ideal client or not your ideal client? 
Well, obviously, the easiest way, I don't know if easiest is the right term, but the most accurate way is to start working with them, and then you'll figure it out. That can also be an unpleasant way. Exactly, because if it turns out they're a terrible client, then you're learning the hard way. So I assume you're you're asking what sort of heuristics can you use beforehand? How do you screen them beforehand to figure that out? Look, one thing that I've heard more and more people suggest doing, that I've started doing, is being very blunt with people about budgeting, asking them, what is the budget? What are your plans for your company? And that can help to frame the conversation and see how serious are they? How seriously have they thought about what they want to do and how they want to do it? Um, and having those sorts of, I mean, I think I also had in my picks uh, a week or two ago, a list of questions, and that was one of them, to ask potential clients. And in some ways, the answers aren't even as important as their attitude toward answering them. Do they see you as just a code monkey who's going to go and program some things? Or do they see you as a real partner in their business and trying to grow it, which in my experience is a far, far more positive sort of relationship? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and what I do is I have two blog posts written on this that I keep referring to, and they'll be in the show notes. But I start with a checklist of like, kind of like what's good, bad, and ugly. And so, like, what are the good things you want in a client? Like, here's a list of them. What are the bad things? And then there's the ugly. And the good are like, you know, this helps make the client more desirable. Bad makes them less desirable. And ugly is like, if they have one or two of those, they're out of running, no matter what. They could have everything else good, but if they have one ugly, it's not a deal. And a lot of that stuff is like, they don't, they won't pay their bills. They have a lot of, they're in like a a business or an industry that I think is questionable ethics wise or morally or whatever. And so I, I have that checklist and there's some stuff that you can kind of, kind of get out at the beginning of the relationship, like through email or maybe like a, you know, a meet and greet or a phone call or something. Um, but then there's going to be the other ones that you have to work with them a little bit. Like they might say like, yeah, I always pay my bills on time. And as freelancers, we know every client always pays on time when they, t- when you ask them, right? Like, <laughs> but I think so you got to kind of go in with like, okay, I think this is how it's going to be, but I don't know for sure. It's kind of like a hypothesis or an assumption. And I think every, depending on the project, like every so often you need to review that and say like, okay, I worked with them for two weeks now. Has any of these answers changed? Another good time is like, if there's a problem, like if there's um, like a rush of like, we need to get this thing built or if there's any kind of like emotional tense moment with them at the end of it, you know, go through, review what happened, review if that changes your answers to these questions. I had one client, I thought he was going to be great. And it ended up, I think a, a month, maybe two months into the project, uh, he was a client from hell and I fired him. Like he, he hit like two or three of those ugly things I had on my checklist and I fired him and he screamed at me and yelled at me. And I was like, well, I will send you my invoice and we'll wrap this project up and just haven't worked with him since. And, you know, I think you kind of need to go in with like, I think they're going to be this good or I think they're going to act like this, but actually find ways to prove it. And it could be, you know, you might ask them, you might ask people on the team, you might ask uh, employees, but you can kind of get a feel for a lot of this stuff pretty quickly, um, at least the bigger ones. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think if you have that list, like you're talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, which is a really good way of putting it, then you really can identify whether or not they're a fit or not. I'm not just saying that in general, but it really does give you the right questions to be asking and gives you criteria to evaluate them on. Because that, that's something that I have failed at in the past is, you know, I don't ask the right questions. And it's because I didn't really know what I was looking for. Yeah. And I mean, a lot, a lot of it comes from, you know, war wounds. Like I've worked with some clients and then ended up like their business model was not going to work. Like their, the, how they were going to make money in their business was illogical. It just won't fly in the market. And so, from then, I've actually changed my ideal client profile, changed my questions to bring those topics to the front earlier. And fairly recently, I've talked with a group and they were, they were looking about doing a thing. And I, I had, I wrote down like, you know, questionable business model. And I, during kind of my new client consultation with them, I, you know, questioned them on it. Like, how is this going to work? How are you going to make money? And they didn't have that great of answers. And I was like, okay, well, going into this, it's it's probably going to be a lot like this other project where it's going to start really, really hot and then they're just going to burn and crash because they can't make money. And it ended up that was very similar to what happened. I I didn't work with them, but I watched them from afar and now their domain doesn't work. You know, there's one of those, you know, buy this domain landing pages on there. 
So that's something to kind of keep in mind is as you get experience, you can do that. And you can even watch clients that you didn't win to see how their business goes. So you can, you know, you have this assumption and let's see a year later if that assumption proved correct. Yeah. That, that reminds me of one of the things on my list. And it was after I'd built two of the four social networks, they never launched. <laughs> and it made me angry because I spent a lot of time working on those social networks. And so for me, it's, You've got to get out there and do something. You've got to, you know, you've got to find a win one way or the other and, and, or at least give it a try, right? And yeah, they just, they never did. And so I, I was just a very expensive pipe dream for them. Right. So that's, that's another criterion, right? You know, there's some people, and I've done this on occasion if it seems interesting. Uh, you know, some people who say, I don't care if the product's going to launch or not launch. I'm happy just to be paid. I'm happy to work on a product. If they're willing to pay me, Great, I'll do it. But there's definitely a sense of satisfaction that I feel when I'm involved in a project that launches and then gets popular and people use it and has a successful business. And so I definitely take into account the business success or potential business success. And partly, of course, it also affects their ability to pay. You know, <laughs> successful companies tend to have more money than unsuccessful companies, I think is a, a pretty good rule of thumb. Right. And that's, and that's like just one criteria though, because I know one client I worked with, they were pre-revenue. They didn't have revenue, but they had a big bank account where, and I knew they weren't going to burn through it very quickly. So like they had that to buffer against it. And so, you know, yeah, it might have been a negative that they don't have their revenue model figured out, but it was a positive that they had money in the account. So I knew it wasn't going to be a, we can't pay your invoice situation. Um, and that's why it's like, it's a balancing act. That's why I like, I like the good, bad and ugly is because you can weigh, you know, okay, well, they have this bad thing, but it's overshadowed by this other good thing. Yeah. And see the, the client, one of the clients that I'm thinking of, the guy that was building or having me build it had a successful business and this was kind of a side thing. And so uh, there was no danger of them running out of, out of money, but I was so excited for the product. And then I was so disappointed when they didn't launch that that that's kind of the situation I was in when we were talking about that particular thing. Anyway, it looks like we're getting on toward the picks. Are there any other things that we should talk about with ideal clients? Just it's it's like everything else with business or with freelancing or maybe even life, which is it's going to take time. It's going to take adjustment. It's a long process. Don't expect that, oh, I'll, I'll make my list and I'll talk to people and in six months I'll find an ideal client. That might happen, but more likely over time the clients will be closer to ideal. Well, and ideal clients aren't forever clients, right? So exactly. even if you find one and even if they're perfect, you're probably not going to be working with them forever. And that could be also because you changed too, not just them. Yeah. That's right. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do the picks. Eric, do you want to start us with the picks? Uh, yeah, I got a bunch here. So I mentioned earlier, I wrote a little while back about, um, ideal clients. And so I have two blog posts on it. One is how to describe your ideal client. Um, and that's talks about the good, the bad, the ugly, kind of the, it's a more of a step by step procedure of how you do this. Um, you could probably do it in half an hour, but if you put a bit more time into it or put time into it, you know, every few weeks, giving it time to kind of marinate, you'll probably get better results. Um, the second one is, reviewing your ideal client definition. And this is kind of like more of a reminder of like, go back, look at your ideal client, when to do that, um, questions to ask yourself, that sort of thing. That's the stuff I've been following. That's the process. Uh, you can dig in, make it as complex or as simple as you want. But if you don't have one right now, um, try to keep it on the simple side. Don't, don't worry too much about a lot of market data, demographic stuff, like keep it basic, keep it, keep it more of rules of thumb and then, you know, tweak it as you get feedback. Uh, the third pick is a post by Amy Hoy. It's called Startup at Skate Plan, How to Free Up Time, Energy, and Money to Build Your Future. Uh, it's not just for startups. It basically, she talks about different types of work you can do, whether it's a job, freelancing, consulting, product business. And for each one, she kind of gives like, if you want to get out of this and into a different one, here's what you need to do. And I think it's really good, especially for freelancers who might feel they're not working with the best clients or they kind of need to get to the next level. She has some really good advice for kind of getting out of the, you know, code monkey, sit in your seat, do your work to the more business advisor role, which is the consulting role. And then my fourth pick, uh, I've been doing kind of a, a yoga thing every night for 
it looks like about four months, maybe five months. Um, I actually I missed it last night and broke a two month streak of it. But I've been using an app called Yoga Studio app. It's uh, for iPhones, iOS. It's great because it's not like you know, you know, here's your class. It's a standard thirty minute, half hour thing. You can actually create your own and mix and match stuff. And so, what have I, I've actually done is made a short, like four minute one that's mostly just like simple stretching. And it's actually let me kind of have this streak for the past four months, and I've been able to do it when I'm sick, do it when I'm traveling, that sort of thing. And the, it's a very, very high quality. It's very fun. Um, there's even some that I've done about kind of running to stretch out muscles and work out stuff to kind of help my running get better. So those are my picks. Cool. Reuven, what are your picks? So I've got one pick for this week. I am, as I said earlier, in Beijing, and so I've been on yet another China, Chinese kick, reading, learning as much as I can. So Eric Osnos, who was the Atlantic's uh, correspondent in China until I think about two years ago, just came out with a book a few months ago called Age of Ambition. And it's about now that Chinese people are making more money and getting more educated, they're running headlong into the government in areas of money, in areas of truth, and in areas of faith. And so he has just fascinating, fascinating portraits of people in modern China and how the government is reacting. And it's it's fun. It, it's First of all, he writes beautifully. And second of all, it's also fun for me here to sort of compare what he's writing with, with what I see and the people with whom I speak. So I definitely recommend that book. All right. I'm going to pick a couple of things. Um, I picked this in the past couple of weeks. I've actually talked about both of these books, the Steve Jobs uh, biography. I finished it on Saturday. So good. So I'm just going to remind you uh, to go pick it up if you have any interest in who he was and kind of the way he was. Um, who is he? He's that guy, that Apple guy. Yeah, yeah, he he was behind the Apple too. Yeah. And then... Uh, <laughs> Whatever happened with him. So the other pick that I have is The Miracle Morning. It is making a big difference for me. I don't know how else to tell people this, but just seriously go check it out. And then finally, if you are interested in learning how to program for iOS... I picked up the, it, it's the course on Ray uh, Wenderlich's uh, website, and it's the tutorial on how to build iOS apps, and it is really good. It's the iOS Apprentice, uh, so go check that out. It's still in Objective-C. I wouldn't be shocked if they come out with a version for Swift. So go check that out. And finally, the U.S. men's soccer team beat Ghana uh, yesterday. And I'm super excited, so I'm going to pick the World Cup. And uh, I'm really hoping to see the U.S. advance, even though they're in a really tough group. So anyway, uh, those are my picks. Just want to remind you, we are reading To Sell as Human. We're going to be talking to Daniel Pink in August. So go pick it up and start reading it. And uh, we look forward to talking about it then. And we'll catch you all next week. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.